The Too Tall Sports Podcast is brought to you by Vegas Sports Advantage. Yes, we have our first sponsor. My thanks to them. Clients of Vegas Sports Advantage are winning big in 2021, and you can be a part of the winning too. Become a client today by clicking the link in the description below of the episode or the show notes, wherever you can find the text underneath this episode on your app or on YouTube in the comment section. Use promo code 2TALL. It's all one word, T-O-O-T-A-L-L, 2TALL, and you get 25% off your package thanks to our partnership with Vegas Sports Advantage. They are a bet texting service. They give you tips. They send you the plays right before the game. Uh, they're not a sports book. You'll make the plays on your own sports book or own sports betting website. They're just going to text you every day with their best plays. They're killing it this year. So my thanks to Vegas Sports Advantage. I use the service as well. Already made money on it. So I'm a big believer. These guys are, are doing really good things with their algorithm and the, however they figure it out. These guys have the advantage. So that's why they're called Vegas Sports Advantage. Check them out. Use promo code too tall. A couple of storylines that I'm looking at and maybe kind of what I'm focusing on as far as um, things that can change just by, by winning a championship and where all these different characters are in the story. So here's my two cents on the NBA Finals for 2021. So the Milwaukee Bucks and Phoenix Suns are in the finals. Both of them haven't won championships in a very long time. The Suns have never won, and the Bucks, well, it's been Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, a.k.a. Lou Alcindor at that point, I believe in the 70s, so way before my time, as I like to tell my dad. Uh, this year, a lot of things, a lot of different storylines going into this. you got a, a bunch of different people at play here. One, you have Giannis, of course, Giannis Antetokounmpo, the two-time MVP, you know, if he wins one, it will kind of validate uh, his two MVPs that he got. And just him winning a ring will definitely solidify, okay, especially if he plays in this series, right? That's a big if. He's been doubtful leading up to the series, questionable going into game one. We'll see what happens tonight in game two. Um, we're not sure. We're not sure what his status is. Does it count if he wins one and he doesn't play in the series? Mm, he got him there, right? So maybe. Um but what would it mean to his legacy? He's only 26 years old. So it, it's not the end of the world for him, but it would definitely help if he were to win a championship. That's for sure. Because a lot of people think he's limited, right? He's not the best shooter. He, when, when the teams really crack down on him, uh, when they build a wall, as they say, the Toronto Raptors did that a few years ago, and he, he, could, he can't shoot. So he couldn't get through the wall and get to the rim like he always does, even as long as he is, he couldn't make it happen. And he kind of faded in that series and he was, he was limited, right? He is known to not be a great free throw shooter. I mean, if you watch that Atlanta Hawks series, the fans in Atlanta were counting one, two, three, all the way up to like 12, 13 seconds by the time the guy shot a free throw. If you know anything about NBA rules, it's kind of a hidden one, but you're really only supposed to have the ball for 10 seconds at the free throw line before you can shoot a free throw. It's They take it away. It's a, it's a penalty. So he takes too long in his free throws. He's thinking way too hard. I think it's for sure all mental. I mean, you watch Ben Simmons now, it's it's all mental, even afraid to go to the free throw line, afraid to shoot. It's a tough thing. Being, being in your head, especially in the finals, when it really matters, it's not a great time to be thinking. You're just, you're supposed, just to, supposed to be doing and playing, right, freely. So we'll see if, if he plays this series. We'll see if he can uh, conquer his free throw demons. But overall for Giannis, I think it's going to be, if he wins one, it will validate those MVPs. And especially if he plays a significant role in these finals, it will, it will definitely count for something for his legacy. But he's still young, so I don't, it's not all or nothing right now for him. Uh, how about his supporting cast? You got guys like Drew Holiday, Chris Middleton. Are they going to show up? Which version of them are we getting? When Giannis has been out, they've been incredible, and they pushed them past Atlanta to get to the next round. But we don't always get that. We don't always know what we're getting from Middleton and Holiday. Uh, both nice, really good players. They're not superstars. So is it fair to count on them to carry the load? I don't know. But I, what I've seen lately, especially in that Hawks series, is that they showed up when they needed to. So do we get those two of those two players? And then you got Coach Budenholzer. Coach Bud, as they say, for for Milwaukee. I mean, if they would have lost to Atlanta, I was on the record saying it. He probably would have lost his job. Probably would have gotten fired. You've gone to the well how many times, and you've taken this team pretty much as far as you can go. That's what it seemed like on the outside. Now, did they get a little luck this year with Brooklyn and Philly not figuring it out? And these other Miami took a huge step back after the championship or after being in the finals last year in the bubble. They had some luck fall their way. 
Um, so they're in the finals, yes. And he could have easily, Coach Bud could have easily lost his job if they would have lost to Atlanta. But now he's in the finals. So do you reward him for getting to the finals now? It's hard to say. You know, if they lose this year, I could still see them finding another coach. It's hard to fire your coach, though, after you get to the finals. It really is. No matter how much luck it was involved along the way, it's hard to fire your coach. So we'll see what happens with him. I thought he was gone, and now he might stay. Let's look at Phoenix. I mean, obviously, the big name is Chris Paul. 16 years in the league, never won a championship, got close a couple times, got hurt a lot. He's blown some 3-1 leads when he was with the Clippers, and he just hasn't been able to put it together. Even when he was really close with Houston with James Harden and that team a few years ago, they had the Warriors on the ropes, couldn't do it. He got hurt, pulled his hamstring. He was out for the playoffs. Houston goes home. But he's kind of revitalized his career. And I, as most of you who know me know, I am a Chris Paul hater, right? I am just not a fan of his. Obviously, I don't know him personally or anything like that. But just from what I see, he's the dirtiest, cleanest player in the league, right? He's got this sparkling reputation. He's got the State Farm commercials. He's got it all. He's the the pretty boy in the NBA. He's a player association president for years. He is the golden child of all of these uh, organizations. So so everyone thinks he's this phenomenal human being. Okay. If you watch him in, in game, sometimes he does some shady stuff. Like he just does. He'll, he's been known to punch guys in the nuts, even back to his college days. There's videos on YouTube. Go look it up. Chris Paul punches guys in the nuts. He really, he does little elbows here and there, the little flops that he does. The way he talks to the refs, he calls guys, he last year, he called a guy out for not having his Jersey tucked in. Team got a technical foul for that. He's just always on the line of annoying, slightly dirty, and nobody really talks about that because he's one of the good guys. Okay, well, I see right through that, Chris. (laughs) So I've always been a longtime um, hater of Chris Paul. However, what he's done with this Suns team has been very impressive. I will say that. Um, He's taken a team that was a fringe team to now they're in the finals again did they have some luck sure they probably did the Lakers weren't at full strength the Clippers didn't play up to their expectations plus Kawhi got hurt so they had some dominoes fall their way but being the healthiest often means you're going to be there at the end because you're you're the healthiest team you're going to you're going to beat teams that are hurt just the way it goes so this championship would definitely validate Chris Paul's career, even if it's against Milwaukee, you know, not sure if they're the best contender in the world, but they're a pretty damn good team. Um, so Chris Paul kind of needs this to solidify his top five point guards in the NBA of all time. I think it would really help his legacy. It would kind of cement it at the end of his career. Not that he's going to walk off on it and be retired, because I think he's still got a little bit left, but his 36-year-old body is a lot different than LeBron's 36-year-old body. It's just, it just is what it is. Um, but for him to, to win a ring, I think it would mean a lot for him um, and his legacy. So he could, so he could solidify himself as one of the best point guards of all time by winning a championship. It's amazing and slightly unfair what rings do to guys. It just is. It's just part of the deal. Um, but this will definitely help his legacy. So we'll see. There'll be some other storylines throughout this, this uh, postseason, but, throughout this finals. We'll let you uh, let me know what you guys think about it. Hit me up on Instagram at Two Tall Sports Podcast. You can email me Two Tall Sports Podcast at gmail.com. Let me know what you think about kind of what we're going to be seeing in the finals. And this is just my synopsis before the finals start. We'll see what actually plays out. If you're looking for my pick, if if Giannis plays, I would say Bucks in seven. If he doesn't, I'm going Suns probably in six, maybe seven. They have home court, but if Giannis doesn't play, might be a tough, tough road here for Milwaukee. So hopefully it's a good series. Hopefully it's a longer series and we don't get blowouts or sweeps. But uh, I'm looking forward to watching. And we got some fresh blood in the finals now. We don't have the same characters. So a new cast of characters are in the finals. So enjoy watching this, this finals uh, series. And uh, we'll recap once it's all done. Enjoy the episode today. Back again with another episode on the Two Tall Sports Podcast. Thank you for joining me today. My guest is Frank Fister. He is a former professional baseball player. He was in the Cincinnati Reds organization, drafted back uh, same year as me, 2008. He became a mental skills coach after on the player development side, played a little bit of independent ball in between there, uh, and went to a small D3 college in Atlanta, Georgia called Emory College. Uh, But he actually helped his team get to the 
Division Three World Series, which we talk about in the episode. Uh, but he's an LA guy, and uh, we got connected to a mutual friend. So great episode with Frank. A lot of great mental skills things. Uh, he, you know, he became a, a mental skills coach. And just the, the mental performance, mental conditioning aspect. He's got some great concepts that we cover in this episode. So stay stick to uh, stay tuned for that. Stick around so uh, once we get to that on the back half of the episode. As always, you can follow me at Two Tall Sports Podcast. That's on Instagram, Twitter. It's at Two Tall Sports. Uh, check out our YouTube channel. You can subscribe there. That'd be awesome. We need more subscribers, more views, more everything. Share it with a friend. Just type in Two Tall Sports Podcast. We usually drop episodes every Thursday morning, so you can hit the bell notification to get notified every time we do so. Uh, on Apple Podcasts, please go there. If you haven't done so already, scroll all the way down to the bottom on the episodes page of Two Tall Sports Podcast. Hit the five stars if you could. That would help with some exposure. And uh, you could also subscribe there, leave a review, drop a comment, need it all. So we really appreciate that. We're also on Spotify. You can follow along there. We're on uh, Amazon. We're on Google Play. We're on Pandora. Wherever you get your podcasts, we're there. Uh, so please go check out Two Tall Sports Podcast. And with that, I will uh, interview Frank Fister. Enjoy the episode. I'll see you on the other side. Two Tall Sports All right, welcome back to the Two Tall Sports Podcast. My next guest is a former professional baseball player. He spent time in the Cincinnati Reds organization and was drafted out of Division Three Emory College back in 2008. He became a mental skills coach in the past seven years, working with athletes of all ages, including pro and college athletes. And he is Frank Fister. What's up, Frank? Thanks for being on the show, man. It's nice to be here, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I know I got a lot of stuff from pre-show from you. So one of my <laughs> favorite things you said, so your last name, it's with an, a P at the front, but your first name also not with a P though. Correct. Yeah. A P a at the front of, of Fister. It's a <laughs> silent P, which, uh, it, you know, actually it's fun. In high school, I think I had some friends that called me P because the silent P didn't get enough credit. So thought that was pretty funny. And then I remember, I think a, a teacher or somebody would write P Frank on a bunch of, on like quizzes if I forgot to put my name. And then one of my best friends still calls me P Frank. So there you go. Can't sleep Officer. on the silent letters. You can't definitely. They deserve credit too. Um, I wanted to get to your background about your young athletic career. So I mentioned you played in the minors, but kind of leading up to that. So you grew up in LA playing sports like, you know, most kids do. Um, when you were in high school, what kind of player were you? And when did you really know you could play at the next level? Uh, that's a cool question. So in high school, I was like super scrappy and um, just like kind of head down work. And it was kind of what I knew. I was I was fortunate enough when I when I finally kind of I played soccer and baseball in high school and um, loved basketball, too. And but I didn't really play it much. But the uh, baseball wise. I kind of, they were just, I really enjoyed the friends that were on the baseball team and, and was lucky enough to play with some pretty amazing players that went on to play in the, in professional levels, college levels, and, and in the big leagues. And we were a part of a program that wasn't much of a program since then the high school has become a crazy program, but um, getting to play with some pretty awesome players, let me be that scrappy kind of dude that just tried, you know, was there to head down, try to win. And um so that was kind of what I was. I played second, second base mostly. I was really small. I think I played shortstop my senior year, but um, was definitely like undersized, you know, like kind of barely could hit the ball out of the infield for those freshman, sophomore years. And then junior year, I kind of started fitting into that field size and uh, kind of got hot and started seeing some, some cool successes. And our team was awesome too. Um, both in terms of people and how we played. So, uh, yeah, that was sort of in, in terms of knowing when I was going to be able to play at the next level. It, it wasn't until I actually got into college and knew that I was going to play at the next level. Like I, I, I didn't really know. I knew that I wanted to keep playing and I tried. Um, there were some recruited walk on possibilities at some other areas. But um, when when Coach T at Emory 
you know, expressed interest. And I had a friend, one of my close friends, Jason Glushan, went to Emory a year before me and told me about the experience there and the guys and the coaches and, and all that. Um, and what Atlanta had to offer, it, it, it really just ended up being a pretty awesome fit. And so each of those levels, even in college, I didn't really know that I was going to play at the next level until it happened. And sure. so that's sort of been a, a familiar story. I, and I always ask guys that decide to leave beautiful Southern California to go to a division three school around the country, randomly somewhere like Emory. I know you said you had a friend there, but there's a lot of colleges here, whether it's JCs or division twos or even D ones. And even in the, on the Western, you know, part of the United States. So what was it about Emory that you were like, all right, I'm going to leave California and go to, you know, division three and try to have success there without, you know, while first time being really away from home. Yeah. Um, as far as the division three thing, I, 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 it was, it was an opportunity to play. I got the idea. I got the impression that I'd have a, a chance to play early, even with where I was physically as a player. Okay. Um, which again, there are no guarantees in, in that at all. And, and the coach at Emory was pretty clear about that. And, and I appreciated that. So for me, it was really like, this is, this is a good, uh, like an unreal educational opportunity at Emory from what I understood of the school and um, a chance to keep playing, which is really all I want. I, I was understood about myself at the time was like, I want to keep playing. Um, now, in terms of going to another place, I, I had grown, grown up in California. I loved it. My family was there and um, I love California. I definitely wanted to, it, it seemed like a good time to try something different. I had looked at schools all around the country. I definitely am not, wasn't ready to do super cold weather, even though I was looking at places, but I also wanted to experience something different. And so Atlanta was pretty cool. Like Georgia, Atlanta, that whole zone was pretty awesome because it seemed like not super extreme cold, but at least it had seasons and it was something different, a totally different environment, which I wanted to experience. And then again, the opportunity to play um, combined with a chance to get a pretty um, special education. So that was those, those all kind of combined to work pretty nice. Sure. And I've heard that theme before with the guys that went to possibly smaller schools or out of state. It's like, look, I'm going to play right away. I'm not going to be, you know, the behind all the scholarship guys that are, you know, see being seen and getting exposure is half the battle. So for you, I mean, I saw that your junior year, you hit a, you had a career average of 370 and your junior year, you had a single season hit record. I mean, you're going off in, in division three and you actually helped lead your team to the division three championship. So what do you remember about that season, your junior year, and then ultimately what happened in the D three championship game or series? Yeah. So that season, I, you know, it's funny. I could probably think back and try to remember some specifics from the actual season, but, and I'm, and I know sometimes people will say it, but it, is about as true as it can be for me that season was those dudes the teammates and and the coaches I mean we had guys on the team who had really nasty injuries that ended up being some of the biggest parts of the team for us a few guys um, or guys that had had injuries and then came back to play that year and made a huge impact which I'm sure we'll get into that later too um, some of the best examples of leadership was on that team. I think we had like, I think we had, we had somewhere in the realm of like nine seniors, like it was very senior heavy. And I, I just remember like the jokes going into that year, I think all of them, but maybe one or two were named captains, which was kind of a funny joke. Like what's our coach doing? And, and, you know, like the examples of all of the guys that were captains and the guys that weren't named captains and still showed amazing leadership in terms of navigating that those, those guys, especially in that class above me, I, I mean, I can't really say enough about it and I don't always express that to them. So it's kind of nice to get to say it here. Sure. Um, But yeah, that, that stood out to me. I know I was mostly quiet in terms of how I led in that team because of those guys. And that's sort of, I think when I'm at my best and I didn't think of myself as leading, um, which is also how I'm at my best, but those dudes would call me out when I needed it. They'd pick me up when I needed it. And um, it was just a really fun, playful 
group that also got the work in very sincerely. And it was a pretty special balance. And we, uh, yeah, we, we played really well and got hot at the right time. Yeah. And then I wanted to follow up with how it went with the, you guys made it to the, the D3 championship and coincidentally it was in a, a Wisconsin where you ended up playing later on as a visitor. So that's kind of cool. You got to double up there, but um, what do you remember about the, was it a championship game or series? So, yeah. So that the, the way it works, so our regional series was pretty crazy and I'll never forget that. Um, Who was that against and where that was. So the regional, we were in Ferrum, Virginia, I think. Okay. Apologies for my uh, lack of awareness of geography and cities and things, but yeah, it was in Ferrum was was the host team, even though I think we were the one seed, and we we had just come off a year where we had lost as a high seed in the regional the year before. We ended up winning a bunch of games early, and then faced Ferrum like we had to win one, they had to win two to move on, and uh, I think we lost the first game. They had they had a pretty incredible like a couple pretty incredible players, and they were just an awesome team and had a pretty special coach from what I understood who'd been there forever and was retiring. Um, and we, you know, we still, I, I have a group text with a bunch of guys where recently actually we still like revisited some old videos of that because we were down to our last out, I think, and, and their students were getting ready to flood the field and, and we were still playing. And one of the dudes who uh, I'll jokingly call a eight year senior, um, yeah. eighth year senior, Sam Cunningham, hit a hit a homer to either tie it or go ahead I think to tie it and then we had a catcher who was a buddy of mine a roommate too um Tyler Short was a catcher and he ended up getting a knock to to put us ahead a little later on but I you know we still joke about that game like we weren't supposed to win it and then we we won it and then went to the college the so we, our joke was we, we, the whole time we call it going to the D3 world series, but then we found out once we got there, I think the night our bus ride back from the regional that only, there was only one college world series and that was trademarked. So like our little D3, you know, our pride in our D3 was like, Oh yeah, it's not even called the D3 world series. We call it, the, you know, D3 baseball championship, but um, it meant the same thing to us. And it, yeah. but it was just a funny joke. And, yeah, got to go to Ferrum. I think we faced Jordan Zimmerman. Like he he was Future played on one of the Wisconsin teams and just shoved. Like he was a I think he was the MVP of the tournament and they didn't make it to the championship, which speaks about how great he was and is. Um and yeah, we we lost that first game to him and then battled our way back uh from the losers bracket on up. And uh then we were the team that had to win two uh to the to I think Kane from New Jersey a team from New Jersey and uh lost that game in extra innings and I was a big part of that loss in extra innings which still hurts to this day and we still again that group text we still joke about the range of us that all thinks that it was our fault like we got a handful of dudes that all sure still play about that but again like um that that group was was amazing and that, and, and I still like, even losing that game, still one of the most incredible experiences and teams that I ever got to be a part of. So, well, that's great. You have those memories. And, and right after that heartbreak of losing the, the championship, you end up getting drafted in the 17th round by the Cincinnati Reds back in 2008. What do you remember about the draft process? And even that day, did you think you had a chance to get drafted? What were the, what were your thoughts around the whole process of getting to the next level? Yeah. I, you know, I just, I knew there were so many players that were great that never got drafted. And I, I had friends that I thought were amazing and still think are amazing and could have competed at that level and didn't get drafted. So I, I kind of think I had an understanding of it. I, there, there were some scouts that had talked to me during and after my junior season. And so I, it was sort of on my radar, but I wanted to take it slow. Like just inside, I wanted to try to manage my expectations. Yeah. Um, it was the year at, I think it was, so I got drafted after my senior year, which was after that year where, um, we had done all those things as a team. And I, I came back that senior year and I, I, done, I did well. And I, I, in some ways I did better than I did the year before. I also know that I fell short in a lot of ways that I wish I didn't fall short in terms of, um, handling it like being a part of handling a different team and we had a very different dynamic and I didn't do a very good well very good job transitioning that 
but it was an awesome learning experience. And those guys were pretty cool too. Um, but then getting drafted, I remember after the season, my senior year, we didn't make the regional. We thought we might. And I decided to stay in Atlanta for a couple of weeks to just work out just in case. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'd kind of, I think at that point I'd talked with my coach and I was sort of at a place where I was like, you know, I, I want to keep playing. And so I was in, and he knew some people with indie ball and we had talked about that. where like, even if you don't get drafted, you might as well, if you feel like it, you might as well keep trying. And so that was sort of my mindset going into that draft was like, I, I knew it was a possibility. A few teams had talked to me, but I just, just didn't know how it worked. I, I had no idea. And um, I basically had a couple little workouts and, and talked to a couple scouts. And I remember actually I was in Atlanta for a couple weeks. I ended up driving home with my dad. Um, he flew out, helped me pack up. And then I drove home with him the day before the draft. And then I think day one of the draft was on the day that we had gotten back home. And I remember like, I remember waking up the next morning getting a text message like early in the morning when they started the day two and I got a text message from a couple of good friends who um, worked at a, a, a baseball school called baseball central in Los Angeles. And my buddy TJ who runs the place um, or, you know, ran and runs the place basically had texted me. He's like, dude, congrats. And I looked at it and I was kind of like freaking out. And I, I looked online and I didn't really want to watch because it was intense for me and I didn't, you know, I wanted to manage it, but I looked on there and I, and it was like at round, um, I think it was round 15 and it said, you know, Cincinnati Reds, who's one of the teams that talked to me a lot said, uh, it said Frank Fisterer. So P F I S T E R E R. And I'm like, fuck, excuse my language. There. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there it is. Go but, ahead. uh, my friend TJ, basically I was like, Oh, he must've made a mistake. You know, you like, how ridiculous is that? This guy who was, you know, a high school kid, I think he was committed to go to Duke, um, got drafted in the 15th round named Frank Fisterer with the same spelling. Um, he was just a little more Pfister than I am. <laughs> and, uh, but then I, I'd kind of like, so I went immediate kind of bummed and then refreshed it and it was in the 17th round. And then there was my name from Emory university. So I, you know, I didn't think there was another Frank Fister at Emory. So that was pretty cool. And I think my, if I remember right, my oldest brother was home too, was at, was staying at my parents' place too, and went down and told them. And it was, uh, you know, I think I was flying out to Sarasota a couple of days later. What are the odds that someone has that similar of a name to you? It was, it was awesome. I was, I was a little bummed, like sneaky bummed that guy didn't sign, you know, he's somewhere and I'm sure yeah. he's doing great. And you know, I know Duke, Duke's a pretty awesome school and, and a, a great program, but I feel like you got to meet him at some point, yeah, like it's yeah, hopefully too, someday, right? It's too, it's too good not to. Maybe but, his friends call him P, you know, never you know, know. You never know. But I, again, I'm glad he was more, he was more fister than I am. It was, you know, it was humbling <laughs> for me to see that. He had a harder time, fist than you. So unique and great. You know, there's yeah. someone out there that's more Frank fister than I am. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So in your early years in the minors, one of the places you got to play at was Dayton, Ohio for the Dayton Dragons. Um, it was one of my favorite places to play. The ballpark's amazing. From what I remember, they sold out almost every night, like great fans, just unbelievable new age minor league ballpark for low A, which is pretty, you know, that's a lower level, but legit uh, stadium. What do you remember about playing in Dayton and maybe some of the, we'll get to the guys in a second, but just playing at that stadium and then playing in the city of Dayton, Ohio. Yeah, it was spectacular. It was, I mean, it, like it was, it was definitely as big league a feeling as I got in my, you know, in my limited experience from that minor league time. And uh, the people there were unreal. The fans were, you know, I, I was on one of the worst minor league teams in the history, in, in maybe in the history of the, I don't know how extreme that wow. was, but we were definitely one of the worst minor league teams that year. Yeah. And um, the guys on the team were awesome. We were great. We figured it out and it was still, you know, that was a cool year, but the fans still showed up and were still cool with us. And, you know, I've been, I've in, in other areas in my career, I've been booed at home fields, but they, they kind of hung with us. And um, I remember like the booster club, especially the dragons booster club, 
I mean, they showed up every morning on road trips before we left and had breakfast cooked for us and had little goodie bags of waters and little treats and, um, helped, helped guys get housing, you know, and, and, um, offered up their own homes a lot of times for dudes trying to find a place to live in that first, you know, for a lot of us was our first full season. Um, yeah. Plan. So they were unreal. I think even, and I, I think I told you when I had gotten released and played indie ball, we had a series pretty close to Dayton and a, a bunch of the booster club came out to watch and I got to see them and I don't even know how they knew, but they, they knew and they cared that much about us as people and they're, they're pretty awesome. And that's, that's another one that's, it's fun to get to give them a little bit of love because it's not always expressed, but they're amazing. And, and the, the chance to get to go back there as a, you know, in more of a coaching role was pretty special and, and to kind of keep seeing it from different angles. And um, I think also they had like, they had some anniversary game a couple of years ago where a couple of friends of mine and I got to, we were, it was like scheduled to be kind of like a, I forget what the, what the, the wording was, but it was like a like the, honorary the who, something. Yeah. It was like, yeah, the, the like an kind of like a fan favorite, all like kind of group of team from coaches or coaches who had been in Dayton who were yeah. on kind of one side with some future prospects that were playing against like that year's Dayton team. And uh, it ended up getting rained out, but it was, it was an exciting thing. And, and uh yeah, loved loved getting to play in Dayton. I think I was there for parts of three years, and even though that's kind of a dubious honor, it's still it was. If you're going to do that, that's the place to do it. Sure, definitely. So during your career, I'm sure you know you had this too. At least during mine, you see guys get through the minors, and you just you're blown away that they got to the big leagues. Like maybe that's just a bitter ex minor leaguer in me, but it's, it happens, right? You just even playing against guys, I'm like how did he make it to the big leagues? I did not see that when I, when we were playing against each other. And one of the guys I remember who was with the Reds with you was Miguel Rojas. And he was an infielder. And now he's, you know, in the big leagues for six, seven years now, Dodgers and Marlins now. And he made it. And I was just like, I could not believe Miguel Rojas made the big leagues, but you have some stories with him. So what do you remember about playing with him and kind of what he taught you just even some little things from, uh, from him? Yeah. So that dude, that dude brought it every day with his energy. And, and he struggled with the bat a lot at that time. I think he actually was, he, I think he raked that year, but I know he had a lot of times where he was struggling in his minor league time with the bat. He had the best hands I've ever seen, or at least one of the, out of respect yes. for all of the great no, hands. He was great on defense, but he was spectacular and getting to play. I played third with him. Some of those days he played short every day and I got to play a lot of third base. And I mean, he was amazing he so he brought energy he was just like a joy for trying to win games I I think he got in trouble a couple times for hitting walk-off homers and just being too excited and it's like he wasn't showing up the other team like he was it was legit and and you could feel it and he was great and he respected the game and he respected his teammates and then I remember him and a and a few other guys but I you know I got to take grounders with him and and he and a lot of other dudes so if I'm not if I'm not given the credit in the right place I apologize but I remember him specifically talking about how important footwork was to him and and respecting even the dirt and like you know I would take grounders and my feet would kind of drag and I'd, I'd sort of like scrape the dirt and leave all these marks and and he really kind of kindly and patiently let me know he's like hey man like respect the dirt like let's try to take these grounders and not even have our feet show and like have footprints show. And, and it was just a really beautiful, subtle way of talking about footwork that stuck with me. And um, I also am proud to say that, you know, him having the greatest hands in the world, I think we were on some road trip and there was a ping pong table and I did get a game from him. I think he beat me overall in the series, but I, I got at least one game from him. And I remember even in low A being like, you know, you might not have known he was going to get to the big leagues, but my thought was like, someday this dude's going to be an all-star and I get to say, I beat Miguel Rojas in ping pong. So there you go. Take it with you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Special, special dude. And, and it doesn't, I'm, I'm grateful for the game that, that he's gotten to have the career he's had. He's, he's awesome. Yeah, no, he seems like a great dude and, and happy that he, he made it. It's, it's awesome that he was able to do that. A few other notable names from the Reds back in the day, at least when I was in the minors and you were there, um, some people might know these names. So Billy Hamilton, one of the fastest dudes I've ever seen, literally would get on first base and you know he's stealing and you still can't get him out. Like it was ridiculous for a while. He had the record one year, I think. 
Uh, Tucker Barnhart was a catcher. He made it to the big leagues. And of course, a lot of people know Didi Gregorius, who started with the Reds, but made a big impact the last couple of years with the Yankees. Um, and then one of your favorites, Donald Lutz, maybe people don't know that name as much, but he came up with the Reds also. So you be, I mean, these are all future big leaguers at the time, you know, 2009, 10, 11. Uh, what do you remember about being around those guys? Yeah. You know, I think one thing that just hearing the names again, that you said, like, they're all amazing teammates. They, they helped me in a lot of ways, like see the parts of myself that were good teammates. And then also they really held me to held me to those parts. Like there's a consistency that you have to sort of learn in the game of that. You can't always be consistent playing because it's going to, the game's just going to beat you up. But you like the, the, the whole idea of like controlling what you can control that sort of, practice towards consistency in how you handle things, whether you're killing it or when you're getting your butt kicked, those guys specifically, like each of them in very different ways helped me a lot. And there were a lot of dudes who didn't make the big leagues who were made huge impacts on me in that way too. But those dudes, I mean, they're on another level for me. And um, yeah, like I remember specifically Billy, playing shortstop. I mean, he did not hit well the first half of that year. I think it was 2011. And I mean, he had like 60 stolen bases and he was hitting like 150. I mean, I don't, I don't get it. They were slide stepping, pitching out and slide step pitch outs, like, and he'd still be safe and then still third. Like it was spectacular. And, but again, what stood out most, like he got hot the second half and ended up breaking a record that year. And I think he broke another, I think he broke his own record the next year. And, Um, but he, he held me to it, man. When I, I'd have times where, you know, I tried really hard to be even and be a good teammate. And there were times where things couldn't, weren't seen like in BP or workouts or in, in the locker room where I was really feeling it and I was in the bitter mode or I was feeling like a victim and I I was having a hard time and he, he would just do it and he'd call me out, but he'd do it in the most playful way. Like he'd, he'd kind of it it was, it was the best. And I, I'll never forget him for that. And, you know, all those guys, Tucker, I remember, I remember him being like 18 in Dayton. I was 22 or 23 or something that year and seeing this guy handle a role. That's the hardest role in my opinion to be a catcher. Yeah. Like it's one of the hardest roles for sure. And that dude's handling grown men at 18 and 19 and working with grown men on the mound. And was awesome. And, and, you know, I, I think that year, even I I'd start catching, I caught a lot of bullpens that year. I was like, just, I played infield, but wasn't playing a lot. And to try to sure. survive, I tried to learn how to catch pens and he taught me a lot and helped me figure out how to catch just to support. He was always really grateful that I was helping out and um, which made it easy to, to take that beating. And yeah the biggest thing I remember and like why it doesn't surprise me that dude's a gold glove catcher and that he's still improving and is still a wonderful teammate and leader is I I just remember there were wild pitches that he no human should block, but he took them as personally as he would take a pass ball. So it wasn't the way that, you know, the way the stat works is a pass balls on him wild pitches on the pitcher, but he prided himself in the craft. At At least that was how I saw it. And, and he continues to, which again, you win a gold glove. You could be, a, you could be, a, you, I mean, you could let it slide and he doesn't, yeah. he, he pushes. And even sometimes that can feel like a backtrack, but he just, he continues to grow. And I think he makes a lot of other people better. And then, you know, I don't know if it's okay. I, I, I wouldn't mind going into the other dudes. If we're yeah, do it. Yeah. I'll say about DD. And I remember I'll say this about DD. When I saw him in double A, I was like, this dude isn't, uh, unbelievable stud like it was hard to get him out he was that good um I knew he was going to be a guy you know I, Don Lutz was you know a first baseman like I wasn't sure like he obviously had power but I wasn't sure if he's gonna make it the big leagues but um but yes please go ahead yeah Didi I would joke he was number 18 and I would think I was number nine and I'm like yeah I'm number nine because I'm half as cool as Didi barely and like because he he was just the guy is an amazing artist and I think he designs a lot of his own tattoos he is just a wonderful human and is so kind to everybody. And um, no matter who you are, all those guys, very even to everybody. And which I think, especially these days needs to be highlighted. And um, but yeah, Didi and I, like we long toss and I'd 
be trying to crow hop to just three hop him. And he's just talking to somebody else and flicking his wrist and throwing it the length of the field. And yeah, he's you a know, special he just, player. Yeah. Grinded it out. And, and, um, you know, continues to be spectacular. And I don't, I don't think he could be properly rated as a player in terms of what he brings to a team, in my yeah. opinion. Um, and then let's see, I think let's see started playing baseball when he was 16 and, you know, probably could have been in the NFL just the way yeah. his athleticism and his body was, he's a huge dude, but loved baseball. And in a time when I was definitely like had played my whole life and had a lot of times where my love of the game was dissolving and fading. And yeah. um, at least how I looked at it, what I thought was love, you know, my enjoyment yeah. for it was definitely yeah. gone. And that dude in his like third year playing is giggling when he hits homers and running around the bases and, you know, plays wherever he's got to play first base outfield, you know, wherever, and just figured it out was fearless in terms of trying new things and still is. And, um, again, like I remember him, he taught again, like he was some, he was a guy that would tell me like, I'm, and I'm still trying to learn this lesson, but the, you know, he'd walk out of the room. The guys were talking trash about other teammates. He'd just be like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk about people like that behind their back. So you just leave. And I'm still trying to get better at that, you know, wow. and, and that's um, hard to do. Not easy. And, but, you know, amazing in that way. And, you know, as now I think he's in Australia, he, he's, he's the king of Australian baseball, in my opinion. And I think in their opinion too, sure. And he, like, you know, hits all these homers still, he's like a player coach when he needs to be and right. coaching young guys and starting a youth, a youth, uh, like a youth Academy over there and doing a lot of that. And, just couldn't, couldn't think of better, like that whole group of guys, man, I couldn't think of better people to be in their different ways, like ambassadors of the game. They're just special humans and special players. And, you know, I have a baseball card of Lutz, especially where he's giggling in, with, in the big leagues, giggling after a homer. And I remember telling him when he was like, just joking with him when he was in Dayton, I'm like, dude, if I ever see you on TV hitting a homer and not giggling, I'm going to call you and I'm going to be pissed. And so it was cool to see him, you know, still, still show that. And uh, yeah, just special dudes. I, I I'm with all the bumps and bruises that come with the game, getting to play with, with people like them and, a, and a whole range of others like them who either made it or didn't make it. Like it's an, it's a pretty endless list and it's still growing, which is pretty awesome. Those four guys, along with others, were on a stacked Pensacola team in like 2012, 2013. They were ridiculous in double A. Like it was, they were really good then. So that's, I remember playing against all four of them, not as much in Dayton, but in Pensacola when they were there, double A for the Reds. That's they cool. were ridiculous. Anyway. Yeah, and I think actually similar manager. So I think in Dayton that year, we had Delano. That was, uh, um, Delano, Jim Riggleman. Right? Oh, Riggleman was there. Yeah. Okay. Delino, Delino might have been in Pensacola either before or after. Yeah. Riggleman was great too. Yeah. Um, they, I, that I, was like 2012. The former, if people don't know, Riggleman coached in the big leagues. I think he played in the big leagues, right? He was a longtime MLB manager, but he had that team in double A. They were really good. Cool. Yeah. I didn't get to, I didn't get to play. I got to play for him in a spring. And that was, um, and that was really cool. I learned a lot from him. Yeah. I think he's a pretty special baseball mind, but I know in, in Dayton that the, the 2011 year where those guys, we were together on that team and, and our manager was Delano to Shields, who's okay. now one of the coaches with the Reds, right? That dude, he's, you know, in the same, same zone as those guys, that guy, um, changed my life for the better in a lot of ways that I'm still learning, still learning his lessons. And again, a lot of other coaches that are similar sure. to those guys, but you know, every you get, you get those coaches that kind of drop some things on you that you know is important, but you don't really know what it means yet. Yeah. He, he was one of those guys that just, you know, he's got gold. He's open with his gold. He's willing to share it. And, and it, and it keeps, keeps growing. Yes. Well, let's get back to your career for a little bit. So fast forward to 2012, you get released, unfortunately, by Cincinnati, and you find yourself playing for an independent ball team, the Schromberg Boomers in, in I'm sorry, Schomburg, Illinois. Uh, you actually have something cool happen there. You were the first player to hit a home run in that franchise's history. So it was a new team in Schomburg. Um, even though it's indie ball, that's pretty cool. So what do you remember about playing in Schomburg, Illinois? 
Yeah, the fighting boomers. I think <laughs> yeah. we called it. Boomer. Which I looked up. It's a chicken. Yeah. It, well, yeah. yeah, some kind of bird. But it's uh, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting. We, we saw some highlight reels of it. You yeah, know, they, yeah. I think the they the staff put together some funny videos of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, that was that was like. Um, you know, I played in the minor leagues for so long, I kind of would think of being released as like, as like death, as like dying. And even the joke, not to be either morbid or taking it lightly, but like the, you know, people would get released and be like, oh yeah, so-and-so you tell stories about some old friends. And then it was like, oh, rest in peace. You know, like it was a flippant way to address that sure. sort of fear of getting released. Right. And uh, getting to, getting the chance to play in Schaumburg with Jamie Bennett, who was the manager and, and that coaching staff, which, you know, I think um, it, was, it was awesome. I mean, I, I think, uh, yeah, Jamie, I remember talking to Jamie and he was somebody like he, he and I think actually Tom Nickel, I think the, the Tom Nichols, the guy who was the announcer in Dayton was one of the guys that helped me get there without me knowing. Nice. So thanks to Tom. And then, um, yeah, Jamie, like, was just starting this organization. And they were like revamping it. I think it had been an organization before and he was revamping it as the boomers. And, you know, he had told, he told me on the phone that he, you know, he wanted to win a championship and he wanted to do it. What he said was the right way. And, and his big thing was team chemistry. So you decided to not play anymore, but you come back to the reds and the player development side uh, more in the mental skills program. Explain how you decided to take that route where you're not playing anymore, not sure what you're going to do. And then sports psychology kind of called to you a little bit and uh, you ended up getting back with the Reds organization. So how did all that go down? Yeah. So um, I got released in by the Reds in 2000 at the end of spring in 2012. Yeah. And um, actually going into that, I, I was one of the rare ones, I think, where the farm director at the time actually called me in the winter and like told me that there weren't a lot of spots and, and like kind of in, in his way, sort of like, let me know, like, it's going to be tough. <laughs> I want to let you know, this is going to be tough for you. You know, this is, we know this is the time of year where you start kind of pushing. Is there something else you'd be interested in doing? And, you know, at the time I wasn't ready to hear it, but I, you know, I think I told, I was like, Hey man, like, are you releasing me? And he's like, no, I just wanted to let you know that it might not be easy. So, and I'm like, are you releasing me? And he goes, no. And I go, all right, well, I'll see you in the spring. And, um, but I remember him doing that and that meant a lot to me. And, you know, cause there's, it's easy to not be straight up in baseball. And I am learning to understand that better and how hard that can be. But it also, at the time I was, it, it just, it makes sense. And I, and I'd like, I respect that he gave me that respect and, um, so I remember getting released at the end of that spring and I had a great spring and, you know, I had, I, I remember guys telling me like, Hey man, like we're going to get an apartment here. And this is like, once we were going through the rounds and I'm like, I appreciate that, but I'm not doing anything until I'm on the plane. Like, you know, like I knew, I just, I knew I was like, we'll see what happens. And, uh, so I ended up getting released and it was tough, but I, I, I knew that it was likely, or I knew it was a possibility that was when at the end of that year, they had brought up the idea of maybe being a, a helping out in performance psychology, which I didn't really know what it was. And I kind of asked and he was, and, and, and it was Jeff Graupe again, who, who had sort of said, well, you know, you just kind of do what you do, like go around, be there for the guys, get to know them, be there. And it's funny. Cause I, I think neither of us really knew the extent of what mental skills and what, sports psychology was at the time I but I I know where his heart was and he wanted to give that support to the dudes and give it to the organization which didn't have that department yet as a lot of teams didn't at that time and um they got me I think um Bill Bavese was there at the time in the organization and he knew Ken Revisa and was gracious enough to get me in touch with him who's one of the the most amazing people that I've gotten to meet in the world and is spectacular in that field and sort of yeah in my opinion was the best that that field has and has spread that feel to a lot of people and I was lucky enough to get to work closely with him at the start of that and he let me shadow him and go to different talks that he'd do and ask me to take notes on what I was noticing and we'd talk about them and um yeah it was 
it was a pretty fortunate thing for somebody who's just starting that who doesn't have a degree in that stuff. And wa I wanted to respect the field. And then also it was, it was a whole blend of stuff. And he was a huge anchor for me there and continued to be in touch with me even when I was doing, doing the work and actually was the mental skills coach for the Reds. Like I'd run my notes by him. I'd run reports by him and, you know, anonymously to respect the players, but he'd help guide me. And um, yeah. So yeah. That was kind of so that. yeah. I worked with, and I told you this off air, but Ken Revisa did a lot of stuff at Long Beach State. He knew a lot of the players that had come through there, and the coaching staff embraced him. So I knew Ken Revisa of him, and he had that book, the Metal Game of Baseball, however, whatever it was called, but really heads great. Up, heads up baseball. Heads up baseball. That's it. Um, one of the better sports psychology books that I've come across, also. So I totally know him, and and he did pass away, unfortunately, but luckily you got to work with him before. And some of the things, so I want to go into some of the concepts that you and him, you know, are big on. You know, baseball is a big sport that deals with failure and success as well, but mainly failure. Um, how do you teach guys the tools to use for those kind of concepts? And one of the ones I really like is homers that you said the other day or said off air to me is homers could lead to slumps and then maybe like an over 20 could lead to a hitting streak. How do you mentally explain that theory? You know, the homer, the homer leading to a slump, I think is a little more subtle, but for me, it's it's how a result can kind of distract you from the process um, and how even, even the process that got you to whatever it was that led to the freedom of, of that Homer or, you know, the, the pitch that you wanted to make that, that was, you know, executing a pitch that you want to make in a big situation or making a play or running the base as well. Like the, you do it well. And if, you get caught up identifying with that result and thinking you're the one that, you know, I did that. And now I'm going to start chasing that. If it distracts you from what got you there, it can lead to some nasty stuff. And, and uh, so I don't know if that was the most articulate way to say it, but you know, most of it was straight up from experience and then getting to see it again and again and to see like, all right, like let's go again. You know, like there were some fun little, um, meditation type ways that I've played around with like expressing that, that have been pretty fun where it's like, you know, whether it's, whether it's BS or really cool S, you know, like <laughs> cool stuff or, 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 or nasty stuff. It's like, whatever it is, we got to, you know, it's, it's, we're letting go of it and then we're going to go again. And, you know, for me, that kind of ties to the breath where it's like, you got to breathe in anything. And, and we can breathe in anything. We can breathe in cigarette smoke. We can breathe in smog and our body can filter it for us. And at that top, whatever it is, nasty or great, eventually we're going to have to let the breath go. And eventually we're going to have to exit. Whether we try to hold all we want, it's going to be gone. And, and as, as much as that can seem morbid, try to hold on at the bottom of the breath. Can't do it. Eventually we're going to need that exhale. And so it's like that sort of life cycle that exists, I think, every breath we take and with every pitch and with an inning and with the game and how that can kind of zoom in and zoom out um, was a, is a fun way that I continue to kind of work myself. And I try to share how I've, you know, how that's helped me. I try to share that with people, you know, in terms of those over twenties and those homes, because, you know, no, if I think it makes... enough, we're going to get hit by both of them. For sure. I think it makes a lot of sense. And I like though, cause that's a relatable life theory as well. You know, like just cause you do something great. You might've just, as they, as we would say, you ran into one, right? Like you just did. That doesn't mean your process is succinct and written lined up or for, you know, whatever, like for instance, myself doing a podcast, you know, right now I'm probably in the O for 20 doing this right now until it becomes a hitting streak. Right. So there's all kinds of stuff that people do in life where you got to put the time in and then it could come out of it as long as your process is right. So I do appreciate you saying that. I want to get to one more before we move on that you mentioned to me uh, before the show. So you, you talked to me about doing band work, right? That it's like kind of in rehab, you only do it in rehab, but why aren't we doing it pre-injury to maybe prevent those injuries or just keep that, those muscles being strengthened? I don't know if it tied into kind of what you just talked about, but I like that concept of do it before this big thing happens versus only reacting to the injury or the negative thing that happens. Yeah. And that, that was something uh, Alan Jager and um, Jim Vatcher were two dudes that I think worked together for, which now are called J bands. Right. Like that was something I, 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 I 
I'm sure it came from other places too, but they're two people that stood out to me on that idea and that they really teach, teach from kids on up that like doing those bands and doing shoulder care in a thought, in a, in a thoughtful, mindful way um, before injury, how much that can help and strengthen your arm. And there are other people that express that in different ways too. Um, But that was where I got, you know, that was where I remember it most clearly. And so getting to see it that way. And then later on trying to share it, but not even sharing that as much as like sharing the idea of we're going to find these in different ways, but let's be open to them before we need them. And, and that was something I think, you know, from that I remember from Eric Davis as when he was one of the special assistants to the GM with the Reds that just, again, is just walking gold. And, And it's not just, again, not just him, a lot of people, but that idea of like, when you're going well, what are you thinking? What are you saying? And, and if you're working with players, when they're going well, what are they thinking? What are they saying? Don't just let it happen. And, and to be aware of that so that you can, and that was something that helped me a lot when I was in the role of mental skills coach was like, it ain't about me telling them stuff. It's more about me listening for what they're saying when it's going great. So I don't take them out of a flow. And also so that I can kind of use their words as remind, like, I remember you saying this, does that still play? And, and those sorts of reminders. So I think in that way, the mental skills stuff, the, the, anything that's, you know, learning, learning coping strategies, self-help type stuff, not self-help. So, uh, I don't know. There, there are other words for it, but um, self-care, I think is a, is a, is a phrase that I think I like a little better. Um, okay. but yeah. Those sorts of things to, learn them and use them and to see the value in them. You know, even as we talked about, I think mental health stuff, like learning those sorts of things at any point will basically like, I think the term was prehab. It's like, they'll be very, if you can learn them in, in a time where it's not survival, you're going to have a, a foundation when life hits you with what feels like survival. Right. Or what actually might be survival. So, yeah. um, you know, again, like things like yoga and meditation, things, like, you know, it, it shows up in so many different ways. And, you know, people get it with art, people get it with music. I, like, I, I've gotten in a range of different ways. And there, I know there are people that as infinite as there are people, there are ways to get those sorts of things. And, um, but I do think that an awareness of it is similar to those bands where it's like, those are the things that we, learn and and have systems to go to when we really need it. And I think that to recognize that if they're that important for our society and for us as humans, when we really need them, that they are equally important when we don't need them to learn the skills and to learn the tools to take care of ourselves and to, to basically support ourselves and support our fellow humans, you know, right. And, you know, so yeah, I, I think that's very important. I think you're right. Last thing I want to get to, um, you mentioned music. So let's talk about you and music and writing and all that stuff that it does for you, whether it's therapeutic or you just enjoy it. What has um, music and songwriting and in general, what has that done for you and your mindset, just uh, living daily life outside of baseball? Yeah, I don't, I don't think I, I think I'm only just realizing how important, how important music has been for me. Uh-huh. I, I knew it in different ways. Music, I studied music in college. I minored in music, which was more like music history and some theory, which I really enjoyed. I played around, I I played piano when I was really young and was lucky enough to get lessons from a wonderful teacher and um, took lessons all through high school. And then, learned guitar I think after high school and a very different in almost the opposite way where I was just trying to learn chords of songs that I liked I wasn't you know I was doing it alone I think I told you I put my roommate at the time my Joe Roth who's one of those guys that you know I really think is a special player that you know one of those guys that could have played on and and for whatever reason it just it didn't happen but he's a wonderful person and a, an incredible baseball player but he you know, and a great musician. And we played music together and, and I put him through, I don't even know how frustrating it was for him when I was trying to learn guitar with him in the room. And he was so cool. Like I tried to learn the same song for about three months 
and he would he would like he would say like hey dude why don't you try learning this song it's a good song I try learning this one like he never told me to to beat it he just like would give me you know other songs but yeah music playing it and writing it has been big I think one of the things was it was an area where I saw failure differently baseball I took it really hard and still do music I I got to learn as I was learning the guitar especially that if I'm trying to learn a song and learning these chords that if I got a chord wrong it wasn't a wrong chord it was a different chord it was a different sound and the amount of times that I would play a chord wrong and hear it like th that was how some of the first songs that I'd play around with writing whatever that means came about it was like oh that's a cool noise even though that's not the noise that is supposed to go with that song so that opened up a whole world for me and then again I I I, I I remember Delino DeShields being the one that said it this way, but, and a lot of people have said it since, but like seeing the game as a dance was an incredible thing for me. It brought those two parts of my brain, life, spirit, all that together, where it was like the rhythm of the game and how that looks and the depth of how that shows up is pretty spectacular to me. And I got to experience that and like learn that and kind of learn to see baseball like I saw music. And at my best, that was when, when I played at my best, that was how I was looking at it. Um, when I struggled the most, it, it was not. And it's been cool to kind of give respect to both parts of myself that, that view things that way because there's strengths to each of them. But um, yeah, the music as an escape, the music as a, a calmer, a, a self-care just in playing or learning something new or failing in a, in a useful way. Like, yeah, en there are endless kind of things. And then just that rhythm, something that I remember Willie, Har uh, Willie Harris saying last year where I got to coach with him. And I think he's with the Cubs now as their third base coach, just special dude. He, he would say, and hang with me if I get it wrong, but it's something along the lines of like, it, people can mess with your rhythm. People can throw you off of your rhythm, but they can't mess with your beat. And he'd say it. And I remember kind of trying to think of the words and, and trying to think, oh, well, is it rhythm? Is it beat? Should it be flipped? And all this stuff. And it hit me like, you know, a month ago. And I sent him a text about it. Where I'm like, dude, I don't know if you meant this, but, and that like, it was like, to me, the beat of your heart, like you, you can't, they, they'll throw off your rhythm. A pitcher is trying to throw off your timing. You're trying to mess with your, there's a dance there, but it's also competitive and you're trying to shake people up, but you can't, no one can mess with your heart. No one can mess with that beat. That's what you got. And along with the breath, those are things that are happening with us, you know, from birth to death. And so I, I think, um, yeah, seeing kind of the musicality and the rhythm of life and the rhythm in nature and the rhythms in baseball and how those are expressed, even if you are not musically inclined, we have that happening. And so I think that's a really cool connector also, which um, big ups to the landlines out there. Um, but yeah, like, I think it's a big connector. I think it's something that we all have in common. We all have a, di you know, all have that different heartbeat and we're all breathing. So we're all sort of doing music. And as we move, there's a rhythm to that. And, and I think, um, you know, the more, the more connectors that we have these days, the better. And so, um, yeah, big in baseball in terms of bringing teams together, the teams I think that are most in tune are with, with that rhythm are the ones that find consistent success and, and, um, the individuals that are able to see that rhythm and find that be able to blend their own beat and their own weird ways of doing things with their environment, with their teammates or whatever's around them are probably going to be enjoying themselves more whether they mean to or not and so i think that's a way that like a, a mental skills or individual dynamic expresses itself in team dynamics and expresses itself as it goes bigger in terms of the overall deal of us being humans trying to get along well hey frank with an f fister with a p thank you for being on the show man it was great uh we all wish you the best of luck and uh, we really appreciate the time and, and like i said i'll mention it again a lot of great concepts and theories so um we really appreciate that my pleasure man thanks for having me and before we go once again i'd like to thank our new sponsor vegassportsadvantage.com they send out expert picks daily and they help clients win big click the link below or in the bio wherever the comments you can find where you can use my promo code 
too tall. That's T O O T A L L. It's one word. You get 25% off all the text uh, packages today. So once again, my promo code to get 25% off the service T O O T A L L. It's one word too tall. Uh, and you get 25% off for your texting packages. They got great plays. They text you the picks right before the game starts. You go bet them on your own sports book or sports betting website. I use the service. It's going great so far. So highly recommend. These guys have been awesome to me. So VegasSportsAdvantage.com. Make sure you use promo code too tall so you can help the show as well as help yourself make a lot of money this year on sports bets. Thanks again. My thanks to Frank Fister. Had a great time interviewing him. Hope you guys got something out of that. I think, you know, I love the mental side of the game. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring him on. I think uh, just the deep psychology there, all the concepts that applies to everyday life as well. So um, I, I'm really glad we had Frank on today. As always, you can follow me at Two Tall Sports Podcast. That's on Instagram. On Twitter, it's at Two Tall Sports. You can head over to our YouTube page, Two Tall Sports Podcast. You can subscribe, hit the bell notification. We drop episodes every Thursday morning around 9 a.m. Pacific time. Check those out. You can drop a comment. You can like it, share it, everything you got to do there on YouTube so you can watch the interviews. On the audio side, it's Apple Podcasts. Like I always say, scroll all the way down on the episodes page. If you could, it takes two seconds. If you're an avid listener, I'd really appreciate it. Or if you're not an avid, avid listener, now you're just joining us for the first time, scroll down on Apple Podcasts to the five stars. Please hit all five if you could. That'd be great. Get us some more exposure. You can even leave a comment there. You can share it with a friend, whatever you got to do to help the show. Uh, Spotify, we're also there. Just type in Two Tall Sports Podcast. We're on Amazon Music, Google Play, Pandora, wherever you get your podcasts, we're there. So go ahead and check out Two Tall Sports Podcast. Thank you for listening as always, and I'll see you next week. Peace.